church uh, for this private service, uh, an invitation only. Uh, we got a copy of the program as the, uh, the funeral is set to begin any minute after the, the family gets set in place uh, because um, Rosalind Carter's casket has been in this church since last night. There will be music to begin the service uh, that you'll hear over the next little bit as we will continue to carry this uh, funeral live here on WTVM. Uh, they'll, you'll hear songs like On Eagle's Wings, The Old Rugged Cross, and Because He Lives. Also, the Georgia Southwestern State University Choir, that's the alma mater of Rosalind Carter. They will be singing Jesus is the Sweetest Name I Know. There will be scripture readings. Uh, there will be a eulogy by the pastor of this church, Maranatha Baptist Church, Pastor Tony Loudon. And the honorary of Paul Bears, of course, have been the Carter's grandchildren. There are also, you will hear during this service,
Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, everyone. Miss Rosalind Carter would love for you to celebrate her life. And so when we say praise the Lord, that's part of her DNA. Amen. So how about we try that again? Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Amen. Listen. I am so excited today that you stopped by and came here to celebrate the life and legacy of the greatest first lady ever. Not just first lady of a White House, but first lady of a global nation where she served every nation around the world. And I'm gonna pray and open up the invocation and then we're gonna celebrate her life Amen. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you so much for what you've done. We lift Rosalind up to you today, God. We lift her life and place it on display for the world that you may get all the glory. And when it's all over, God, you'll be to say to your daughter, well done, my faithful servant. We bring into this house a woman and came in and worshiped you and gave you thanksgiving. When she learned about her faith, she took it outside the walls and took it all around the world. God, we thank you today. We honor you for all that you've done in her life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Next, we'll have a scripture reading by Josephine Beverly Murphy. A reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Next, we'll have a tribute by John William Carter. When I first knew my mother, she was a teenager. But I thought during the first six weeks before she hit 20, she did a great job. <laughs> she was young, but she got us started while dad was mostly away at sea. She told us later, uh, stories later about uh, her logistics nightmares with three boys, two, two bags of groceries, and one bus. She found solutions and in inner strengths and wasn't always quiet about disagreeing with Dad. Chip told you yesterday about the drive from Schenectady, New York, down to Plains when Mom wouldn't say a word to Dad except through me. <laughs> Jack, please tell your father that. Huh? There was another similar case when we did a family trip, up the, uh, a camping trip, up the eastern seaboard, and we saw tobacco uh, being auctioned. Um, we ran up and down the dunes that the Wright brothers had flown on, and the three boys were able to transfer an amazing amount of sand from the North Carolina, uh, uh, North Carolina Outer Banks into the tent, and Mom finally broke. <laughs> she was not going to spend another night in the tent. So Dad had to uh, buy a hotel room. And I remember the price vividly because he said it over and over. <laughs> it was $28. <laughs> the great thing was you could go up onto the top of this uh, hotel building and you could look across uh, the river and you could see the Washington Monument and all the lights on. And we were, I may have been 12 years old. It was an amazing place to go. It occurs to me that Dad got used to Mom disagreeing with him <laughs> because she was really good at it. Uh, and she became a partner in the true sense of the word, where they had equal footing. I 
she was also good with numbers and thought that it wasn't right to pay the CPA uh, because she was never wrong on the numbers. <laughs> she was also somebody that you could trust when things got out of hand. I remember making a, uh, an angel food cake after I got home from school one day. I was, again, 12 or 13. And I followed the, uh, uh, the recipe on the box. And I was really trucking along. And I put it in the oven. It was just going to be great for, uh, for the family when they got home. And I started a fire. So I turned off the oven and I called mom and she explained the difference to me between broil and bake. <laughs> and then she came home so I, she could clean up the, 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 the black crust on top of the cake so I, maybe I could salvage something later on. My mother had a funeral yesterday. It had three presidents and six. Uh, and uh, six first ladies. And I believe that the reason that she was able to do that was because of what she had learned from us boys and what she had taught my father. Thank you so much for being here. Jesus, Jesus. 
Next, we have one of the tallest young men in the entire room, Charlie Carter. Take it. I got you. Ephesians 4.32, be ye kind to one another. Awesome. And next we have, he keeps me singing. I'm sorry, the tallest young man in the entire room, <laughs> Josh Carter. It would be helpful to preach a keep up, right? Good morning. My name is Josh Carter, and my dad is Jeff Carter, Rosen's third son, who was born on her 25th birthday. My dad asked me to speak today about my grandmother on his behalf. My cousin Jason was the first grandchild, and he was born when Rosen was 47. She didn't think she was old enough to be a grandmother, so Jason called her mom. This led to almost four decades of my brother and I saying, do you mean mom, mom, or Rosen mom? And today I'm talking about Rose and Mom. Mom's a perfect name for her and who she represented in our family. She was kind, loving, and caring. She drew a lot of energy from her grandkids and later her great-grandkids. She loved her family. And she was happiest whenever there was a new baby. Every time we had a new baby in the family, she could not wait to play with them. And she did play. In the same Carter Center boardroom where my grandparents would host presidents and other world leaders, Mom, in her 80s, would get on the floor and chase babies and play peekaboo. One of my favorite memories was during the Carter Center weekend. My dad and I were visiting mom in her hotel room, and mom, at 91, picked up my son, put him on her walker, and chased him around the room. Airplane noise and everything. I have a picture of that, and, the, and both the smiles are so big that it takes up the entire photograph. In fact, Mom sat down and colored with her great-grandchildren just two months ago at Papa's 99th birthday. She loved our family. My grandparents got us together every New Year's. And one of her favorite things to do is watch her grandkids play at Disney World. And we went a handful of times, and uh, we did Disney World a little bit differently than most people. We never stood in line. <laughs> our Disney hosts would slip us in the side door at every attraction and get right on the ride. And believe it or not, mom's favorite ride was the Tower of Terror. <laughs> and it became pretty clear that a lot of the Secret Service did not share this opinion. <laughs> so as we got older, one of my favorite things about Disney was hanging back within earshot of the agents negotiating about who was going to go on the ride. <laughs> and we have fantastic Disney World pictures of mom beaming with excitement at the top of the tower and the agents behind her looking like they're about to throw up. <laughs> of course, we got this treatment because my grandparents were the first family. I wasn't old enough to see her in the White House, but I grew up watching my grandparents build the Carter Center. I was very young, but I was there at the beginning. So I grew up watching the Carter Center mature as my grandparents tackled problems that were so grand, they seemed almost insurmountable. Latin America and Africa were dominated by strong men, and my grandparents wanted to install democracy. Humanity had only ever eradicated one disease, and my grandparents wanted to eliminate five. And at a time when mental illness was looked on as a failure of character, Rosen wanted to eliminate the stigma and treat mental illness as any other disease that could be diagnosed and treated. My grandparents wanted to do all three of those things at the same time, and they've been unbelievably successful. 
But no matter what she was doing, Rosen was always mom. My dad worked at the Carter Center and we lived close. We were there all the time. And we would often meet up with her after she held a symposium on election monitoring or a guinea worm. And mom would just want to make sure that we were fed and to let us know that she had bagged up fresh blueberries from the farm. And in fact, I bet there are blueberries in her freezer at the Carter Center right now. It was fun watching my grandparents talk about their work at the Carter Center. When I was young, I just enjoyed listening to the stories, but as I got older, I started to recognize some patterns. My grandfather liked statistics, facts, and figures. If I want to know how many doses of mechtazan they're giving out to treat river blindness, I'd ask Papa. But Mom was motivated by the people. Mom's stories were about a performance that a village had put on in her honor. Or they would tell us about children playing in a village that was formerly afflicted by trachoma. Or she would tell us about the astounded joy on people's faces when they learned that something as simple as education and a filter cloth would rid the entire village of guinea worm, a plague so ancient that Moses wrote about it in the book of Numbers. She saw people in forgotten corners of forgotten places as people who have hopes and dreams and are worthy of love. My grandmother used the Carter Center to continue her 50-year mission to end the stigma around mental illness. And she built programs such as fighting for mental health parity and teaching journalists how to write about mental illness. And that was the strategist of Rosalind. That was her political savvy. But the reason that she built those programs in the first place is the same reason she did everything at the Carter Center. Once again, she saw people that were suffering from mental illness as people who also have hopes and dreams and are worthy of love. Rosalind went to almost every corner of the world and met with people from all walks of life. She worked with everybody, from world leaders to people living on less than $1 a day. And when she told us stories about the work that she was doing, she would only ever focus on the people, on humanity. Everywhere she went, she would tell us that the people were just as smart and just as capable as she was. She helped wherever she could. She was mom. My grandmother lived one of the most incredible lives this world has to offer, so I'll close by telling her story about the best part of her life. She married a naval officer who took her around the world on a life of adventure. She is a woman from Plains, Georgia, who became a champion hula dancer in Honolulu, Hawaii. <laughs> and she thought it was the best time of her life. And when she left Navy life, she thought the best part of her life was over. But then her husband got into politics. And she got him elected as a state senator, as the governor of Georgia, and finally as President of the United States. Being First Lady was exciting and rewarding, and she thought it was the best time of her life. And when they lost re-election, she thought the best part of her life was over. But then my grandparents built the Carter Center, and she spent the rest of her life improving the lives of people across the globe to free them from oppression, eliminate crippling diseases, and to help people with mental illness live healthy, fulfilling lives. And she knew that was the best time of her life. And she always closed her story there. So today, as we celebrate her life, we know that the best part of her life lives on. But I'm still going to miss you, Mom.
Next we have Adeline Kane Chandeko. Did I get close, Adeline? Hmm. <laughs> we practiced all week. A reading from Luke chapter 1, verse 45. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. I believe she's going to be first lady one day. <laughs> Listen, thank you so much. I won't be long today with the eulogy today. I know it's been a long week, but it's been a great week. It's been a week that we celebrated the life of one of the greatest women in the world, Sybil. There's no place on this earth that you can find anyone that has anything bad to say about Rosalind Carter. Not one word, not a news article, not even one person on the left or anybody on the right. I believe, Chip, the reason why is because she did not worship the donkey or the elephant, she worshiped the lamb. And so today, I want to tell you a little bit about her, the way I see it in my eyes as her pastor. I like to say, Danny, that she loved on me and my family just like a son. I like to say, Chip, when she hugged on my daughter and I watched them play with Orcus in the room there, it just melted me as a father. I searched all over trying to figure out what can I write and say about this great woman. And so men, I have nothing to say to you today. I just want you to listen. I want to talk to the women in the room today. And the title of my eulogy is First Lady. Because that's who she was. To the caregivers, if you talk to any of the caregivers and pull them to the side and ask them to tell you about Miss Carter, they'll say she's an angel. They'll whisper to you, she is awesome. You've asked any of the sons or daughters. Now, yes, I call them sons or daughters because they fell in love with her. Yes, any of them that protected her. They'll say, Dancer, she is incredible. If I had to bring up Alejandro up here today, and he'll say, let me tell you, I love that woman. I love her with all my heart. She's like a mother. I never forget he was telling me how he was inside the surgery room, in the, in the room guarding her as the doctors was working on her. Why? Because she was a dancer. And he had to take care of her. He had to make sure that she was safe. But more than that, he loved her like a mother. We are here today not to mourn the First Lady. We're here to celebrate her life, to remember her, and to comfort one another as families and friends who finally remember the ones who life touched ours in so many precious moments. We're here to continue the mantle. If I had to go on and describe her, I would say she was all about a family. I believe, Chaplain, that if you did anything to the family, she might have beat you up. <laughs> because it was all about the family, Josh. We had a revival here at the church one day, a revival. And she lost her daughter in love, Annette. And she said, go get the pastor in the middle of a revival. You know why? Because she wanted to make sure that her grandson and her son was okay. She wanted them to be comforted. She wanted them to be loved on. She wanted them to be prayed on. 
She wanted to make sure that the family was okay. Her family, her neighbors, her friends all knew her to be someone who did not think of herself, but rather others and others' needs. Her care and concern for those around her defined her and left the most remarkable impression upon our hearts and memories as we remember her today. The challenge that each and every one of you are going to have is how are you going to see the next day of her legacy? Will the women stand up and be first ladies? Will the women around our nation have a little bit of Rosalind in them? Were they willing to fight for those who are hurting, broken, and crushed in spirit? Were they willing to look at a baby from Sudan and say, that's my baby too? Were they willing to see another baby from Cambodia and say, that's my baby too? Were you willing to walk down the street to the Boys and Girls Club and say, those are my children too? That's who she was. If you ask the church members about her on cold days like it was today, on the first of the month or the last of the month, she'll be sitting out there filling out paperwork so she can feed those who need food to make it through the month. And not one time did she complain. A loving wife, a caring mother, a dotting grandmother, and a devoted friends. She had schedules, she kept notes, post notes. She did all of that stuff. But one of the greatest things I saw her share with me was that every time I came to see her, she would grab a pen and she would say, who can I pray for? She asked the question, where have you been? What have you done? Who have you helped? And finally she would say, how can I help you help them? And I would say, this person needs prayer and that person needs prayer. And the next thing out of her mouth, she says, get me their phone numbers so that Jimmy and I can call them. Many of you sitting here today doing tough times in your life, you've had a phone call from her or a note from her saying, I'm praying for you. When Deacon Mashuk passed away, she reached out because she loved him. This man, not from this country, a Muslim who became a Christian. She loved him and his family. That's who she was. Tony, what are you talking about? Well, if I had to describe her and build a business case of who she was, I would have to take you to the only thing as always in print and read all around the world, several different translations, several different languages. And it's called The Virtuous Woman. My Facebook might say The Virtuous Woman from now on with a picture of her because that's who she was. Proverbs 31 and 10 through 31 says, who can find a virtuous wife? Jimmy Carter. <laughs> For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of a husband safely trusts her. She will have no lack or gain. She does him good and not evil, and all the days of her life she seek wool and flax and will willingly work with her hands. How many of you seen Miss Rosalind work with her hands? It goes on to say, she is like the merchant ships. She brings up food from afar. I heard Chip talk about her making sandwiches on a plane. And all on the bus, we're laughing about the kids talking about grandma making sandwiches on the plane and handing them out. She was that merchant. And she girds herself with strength. And I want to tell you, during our weakest times, 
I've seen her love on everybody around her and give them strength. The AIDS, her children, this church, the pandemic took something away from her. It took her church away from her. She wasn't able to come like she used to. And she always asked, how's Miss Carol? How's Miss Mildred doing? How's Miss Sybil doing? When she realized someone was hurting, she didn't ask for prayers for herself. She asked for prayers for other people. Annette Wise, Phil Wise. I can go on down the list of her naming people asking for prayer for them. Polly, she loved you. She loved you. Ruth, she loved you. Maranatha, she loved you. She loved this church. She loved why it was created, and she loved what it stood for. See, there was no anger in her heart or her soul or her walk. When you met her one day, she was that way the next day. She was real as they get. She was a virtuous woman. And her lamp does not go out. And she stretches out her hand to the distaff, to those who are broken, those who are hurting. And her hand holds the spindle. And she extends her hands to the poor. That is who she is. Wouldn't it be awesome if we had a nation full of first ladies like that? Wouldn't it be awesome if we had a world full of first ladies like that. She was the virtuous woman. Every man in this room longs for a virtuous woman in his life, whether it's Nana, Grandmama, or even his wife or his daughter. Buzz, everybody longs for this virtuous woman. Some of you in here know what it's like to lose a virtuous woman. Have you lost your mother? I lost a grandmother. I lost a wife. You've lost that woman who was the foundation, the matriarch of your life. And all of a sudden, your heart starts to think about what am I going to do? And your mind starts racing and tears start falling. But I'm here to tell you today you should think about Miss Rosalind. And don't complain, because she was competitive. <laughs> Oftentimes on a compound, President Carter is in his fast wheelchair. The Secret Service is pushing him at a nice little pace. <laughs> Miss Rosalind is in her walker. Come on, Tony, we're going to beat him today. Come on, we're going to beat him today. She never stopped competing. She didn't retire on the Lord. She didn't quit on God. Tony, do you have proof? Yes. She did more in her latter days than she did when she was in the White House. When half the country said we no longer wanted you, she said, I am still going to go to work. Why? Because faith without works is dead, been alone, and I'm a virtuous woman. Because I love my Lord, and I'm going to give him all I got. And all the way to the age of 96, she gave him all she had. She never quit, never complained. In the cold, she walked. I pull up on the compound, I ask the agents, how she, well, she was just out walking. Because she never gave up. Henry, she 
reach out her hand to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her households is clothed with scarlet. She makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates. You heard Josh say, first lady got President Carter elected to Senate and then to the White House and governor made him known in the gates and known all around the world. The Bible says when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. She was the virtuous woman. When she sits among the elders of the land, 122 nations, strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness, not division. Why? Because when her husband grabbed the Bible and placed his left hand on the Bible, and raised his right hand to make a commitment to serve and serve well. She held the Bible. And as he made that commitment, she made that same commitment to serve and serve well, to be a servant leader with a servant heart. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had more leaders that kept that covenant and served well with a servant's heart? and not wanting you to serve them. That particular scripture goes on to say, at the end, her husband also and praises her, and many daughters have done well. And it closes by saying this, but you, First Lady Rosalind Carter, have excelled them all. That's who she is. That's what she would want us to know. What she wants you to take it with her. Take it in the highways and the byways. Take it home to your daughters. Is it time now for us to bring back the virtuous woman who can stop our children from shooting and killing each other on the streets? Isn't it time to bring back more virtuous women that can tell government that we should not be locking up the mentally ill with those who are in the gangs? Isn't it now the time that when men and women come home from fighting some of the longest wars that a virtuous woman stand up and tell government we got to do better with our virt veterans who are having trauma? Isn't it time now? Rosalind Carter would say yes. You have an obligation today not just celebrate. You have an obligation today to live on her legacy and walk in her path. She would say to you today, don't grieve for me, for now I'm free. Don't grieve for me because now I'm free. I've won the prize. Jimmy tried to beat me here, I got here first. <laughs> I've won the prize. Tell him I beat him and I'm waiting on him. But she'll tell you, don't stop. There's still too many homeless people in the world. There's too many people that still don't have equal rights. There's still too many people that are suffering from mental illness. There's still too many people that look at the color of her skin. She'll tell you, don't stop. Become that virtuous woman. And men, if you're listening, make room for the virtuous woman. The Adeline can grow up and be the virtuous woman of the nation. That Josephine can grow up and be the virtuous woman of the nation.
that each and every woman in this room can be the first lady of her home. That each and every young lady in this room know that she has a virtuous woman DNA inside of her. That Michelle, from her protection detail, can be the virtuous woman in secret service. She loved you, and there was nothing that you can do about it. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you today for my friend, a woman that I loved, a woman that I'm going to miss. I thank you, God, for her taking a spirit and pouring into my daughter. I thank you, God, for her bringing these young men into the world that will take her spirit and continue to change the world. I thank you, God, for allowing her to be shared with all of us. Now, God, as our sons and daughter get ready to take dancer, grandmother, wife, first lady to the world, when they get ready to take her to her final resting place, we will say, our first lady excelled them all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please remain seated for the receptional, <sighs> processional, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kim. <laughs> I want to tell you, the Carter family and Buzz and Kim and all of Maranatha, it was so good to see you guys today and celebrate the life of Rosalind Carter. I miss you guys. And I love you. And Winston, ain't nothing you can do about it. That's what happens when you got a crying pastor. <laughs> we have amazing grace, and we're all going to sing it all together. Can you stand, please?
Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we love you. We thank you. We say to God, be the glory for this vessel. We pray for the Carter's family, God, and we pray for Jimmy Carter that you will continue to strengthen them and comfort them during this time. We pray for planes and the world that is grieving the loss of this virtuous woman. We pray, God, that you give us comfort, that you give us peace, but you allow us to continue the work. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you be seated, please? Please remain seated during the recessional.
They're coming out now. They are. Okay. Total shot. <laughs> <laughs> now nah, you're good. Morning. Morning. How's it going? It's just afternoon now. Uh, oh yeah, I guess it is.
Here they come.
watch that.
Hey, these are. Okay, man, appreciate that. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's cool. All right, appreciate it, man. Yeah, every time we did, uh, I was talking to Victor um, as I got everything set up and all that. So we got everything set up. All right, appreciate it, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what we, that was our route, that's our route. Um, okay, um, so quick thing, the first bus I'm gonna send is gonna be the big bus for Maranatha members to go to the luncheon, or no? Oh, 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 okay. For some reason I thought one of my buses would go there. Clearly I was confused. Is Megan okay? Good. Is Megan okay? Good. Okay. Five minutes. 